understand all that symbolic talk in Revelation. You may have heard people ask this question about prophecy in Revelation, and perhaps they go on to say something like, you've got the beast and a woman clothed with the sun and a red dragon and a child. How does it all make sense? Welcome to Through the Bible. One of the advantages of studying the Bible the way we do, weaving back and forth between the Old and New Testaments, is when one refers to the other. Such is the case today as we open our Bibles to Revelation 12 and read about some strange figures. What do they mean? We wonder. Well, we'll find out today. As you find your seat on the Bible bus and in Revelation 12, let's hear a couple of encouraging letters and visit with people whose lives have been transformed as they met Jesus and as they've grown in faith through God's Word. Years ago, Dr. McGee read this letter, which confirms how the Lord transforms our lives. Let's hear it again. Now, I have a letter to share with you that I'm not going to give you the place at all, any indication of it, and you can understand why. We're trying to show that homosexuals are being converted today. Now, for several years, we've had letters from these that have been caught up in this, and the latest study apparently is making it very difficult for some liberal preachers to say this is something that's in the genes of an individual they've inherited as two scientists, two doctors, New York City, and I think elsewhere now have made the statement that this is something that you're not born with at all. And the very fact they can be converted reveals that. So we today want you to hear this letter now. This part, it says, it's in elation and long at last finding a way through the Lord via your sharing on the radio, which we now listen to every morning. Both of us, being prior homosexuals in the worst way, have dropped our facades and are now wanting to work for the Lord in helping others to repent. Not only other lost homosexuals, but those who wandered away from the Lord and the teachings of their parents. For a long time, we did not know the answers to our deviations, and that went along with it. We both feel that we have robbed God. So elated we are in our new way of life that we take the Word of God to the campus of the university here. We do suffer some tribulations on the campus from our past homosexual friends, but find these attempted setbacks as a stronger foundation on which to help you bring the message to those who have lost their way. Let's pray for each other as we hear how others suffer in order to walk with Jesus. Stefio from Moscow asked for our prayers in a similar way. How do you know when Jesus has changed your heart? When you walk away from everything natural to you, anger, frustration, all manner of man when he feels provoked by the world, in a corner, as you say, when you can say with all meaning, Jesus provides a better way, I offer you my thanks for your prayers for me as I leave my former way and walk in newness of life. I admit I don't know how to do this except every day I listen to the word of God and my willingness is strengthened. My purpose is defined in Christ. Please don't forget me and others who trust in God first in their family. No, we won't forget to pray, Stefio. In fact, we'll do it now. Heavenly Father, as brothers and sisters in Christ, we remember Stefio and so many others like him who are the first in their families to follow you. Please continue to strengthen them as they walk in newness of life. Turn our eyes now to Jesus in our study of Revelation 12, in whose name we pray. Amen. Here's Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Now, we just got down to the 12th chapter of Revelation last time, and the blowing of the seventh trumpet not only went ahead and covered ground right up to the door of eternity, but in a very brief manner, but there were many details that were omitted. So 
we are having introduced to us now seven personalities, and I'd like to introduce you to them today and next time. And also, I will have to follow that, the seven bowls of wrath. They are the worst of all. And then we have the fall of religious Babylon and also commercial Babylon. Now, we want to take these seven personalities and last time, we just introduced the first one and identified it. And I read verse 1 again. And a great sign was seen in heaven, a woman arrayed with the sun and the moon under her feet and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And she was with child and travailing in birth and being tormented to be delivered. Now, we identified that woman as Israel. And we identified her as Israel, and we only mention the first. That is, the things that are identified with this woman are also identified with Israel. From the very beginning, there was old Jacob and Rachel, and then the 12 sons that he had. And when Joseph had a dream why, it was the sun and the moon and the star, There's 12 stars, 11 stars, I should say, made obeisance to him. He was the 12th one, of course. And old Jacob interpreted that to mean, shall I and your mother and your 11 brethren fall down and worship you? And they did before it was over with. The mother did not, of course, but certainly... This is representative of the nation Israel. Now, as we indicated last time, the woman is a sign in heaven, but her career and her mission is here on the earth. And it's made very clear she's not a literal woman. The career of the woman corresponds to that of Israel. And it's Israel that gave birth to Christ, who is the child. Now, I want you to notice some scriptures I trust in the right light that we might understand them. I know that all of us do this at Christmas time. We use Isaiah 9, 6, as well as other verses concerning the birth of Christ. And actually, it does concern the birth of Christ, but doesn't concern us at all because it concerns the nation Israel. It says, for unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. Now, who is us? Now, I know what that's wrong grammar, but that's what I mean. Who is referred to here when it says unto us the church? No, the nation Israel. It's quite obvious that Isaiah was speaking to the nation Israel. And he's speaking to the nation Israel, not relative to a savior, but a governor a ruler, a king, one that was to come and rule over them. Unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And it's interesting, the child is born, is humanity, but he was the son from eternity and he was given. Now it says the government shall be upon his shoulder. We're talking now not about the Savior that we talk about today, but the one who's coming is king. We're going to see that in this book. And his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And that's interesting. There won't be any peace till he comes. Because when they say, that is, the, the rulers of this world say, peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them. Why, you know, they were having a big peace congress in Holland when World War I broke out and most of the delegates almost got fired on before they got home. May I say to you, when they say peace and safety, it's idle because man is working at peace from the wrong end. It's the human heart that's wrong. And only Jesus will bring peace. He's the prince of peace. Now, it's talking to Israel here. Unto us a child is born. And that's the figure that John picks up. And the writer to the Hebrews says in Hebrews 7, 14, for it's evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah. And Paul in Romans 9, 5 says, 
whose are the fathers, and of whom, as concerning the flesh, Christ came. He's talking about Israel, because he began by asking the question, who are Israelites? Well, they just happened to be that concerning the flesh, Christ came. The woman at the well was accurate. How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, a woman of Samaria? And then we have in Micah 5, 2 and 3, but thou Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that's to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been of old from everlasting. You see, he'll be born in Bethlehem, but he comes out of eternity. Therefore will he give them up until the time that she which travaileth hath brought forth then the remnant of his brethren shall return unto the children of Israel. And travailing in birth is associated with Israel in Isaiah 66, 7 and 8. Before she travailed, she brought forth. Before a pain came, she was delivered of a man-child. Who hath heard such a thing? Who hath seen such things? Shall the earth be made to bring forth in one day? Or shall a nation be born at once? For as soon as Zion travailed, she brought forth her children. But it had to be the birth of that son first. And so we identify the woman as the nation Israel. And no woman that has lived or ever lived fits in this, even including the Virgin Mary. It's the nation Israel, and certainly not the church of all ages. Because if we'll just keep our bearing here, and not lose our heads, we are in the great tribulation period. And the church has already gone to heaven. This woman is not the church of all ages. Now, she is tormented, and certainly this nation has suffered satanic anti-Semitism from that day till the present. In fact, even before that day, because Satan knew that it would be from this nation. Now, we have introduced to us another character, and this character is really not a delightful one at all. It's the Red Dragon. This is not a funny paper characterization either. Nothing funny about him. In fact, it's very solemn and serious. I'm reading my translation, verses 3 and 4. And there was seen another sign in heaven. You notice these are signs that are given to us. And... They're not literal. I told you John would make it clear as he went along. If he's giving you a symbol, he'll make it clear in some way to you that that's what it is. There was another sign in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns, and on his head seven diadems. And those are kingly crowns, by the way. And his tail draweth the third of the stars of heaven, and he did cast them into the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman about to be delivered, and when she was delivered, that he might devour her child. Now, this is a sign that sets before us the red dragon, and the red dragon is Satan. You're going to say, how do you know that? Well, I know that, because verse 9 will identify him. And I'm reading verse 9. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So that we can identify this character without speculating at all. Now, in this second sign, the true character of Satan is revealed with all the wrappings removed. He is great here. We're told that he's the great red dragon. He's great. And he's great because of his vast power. He controls the nations of the world and offered them to the Lord Jesus if he'd worship him, because that finally is what Satan wants is worship. And he offered the kingdoms of this world. He said, they're mine, and they are his. And he controls them today. We've already seen that. In that day, it was Rome. But he's controlled every nation, you see. Now, it says he's red. 
And because of the fact that he was a murderer from the beginning, John 8, 44 tells us that. He has no regard for human life. And why so many today serve him? Why is it that alcohol finally kills you? It's the worst killer there is today. Well, because Satan is back of it, friends. He has no regard for human life at all. Now, he's called a dragon. Why? Because of the viciousness of his character. He was originally created Lucifer's son of the morning, but he's now the epitome of evil and the depth of degradation, the most dangerous being in all of God's creation, your enemy and my enemy if we're a child of God's. Now, we're going to be introduced later on in chapter 13 to a beast. And the beast in chapter 13, similar to the dragon. Why? Because we're going to see that it's the dragon there that brings out the beast. We'll see that when we get to it, and I'll say that until then. Now he has seven heads. I think that suggests the perfection of wisdom, which characterized the creation of Satan, who was originally the covering cherub. And in Ezekiel 28, 12, which speaks of his origin, it says, Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus. And he's put as the figure there of Satan. And say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. And this reveals two of the fallacies that the world has concerning Satan. They think he's ugly. May I say to you, he was created perfect in beauty. And if you could see him today, you wouldn't see the foul creature that is pictured for us today by the world, even on a bottle of water that is sold today for certain purposes. There is that being Satan, and he has horns, he has cloven feet, he has a forked tail. That's the great god Pan that the Greeks worshipped and Rome worship. That's not Satan, although Satan was back of that worship. And you find that temple in Pergamum. I've seen that temple in the ruins of the different temples to the great god Pan in, I suppose, a dozen cities. He was certainly worshiped. It's not strange today that men are worshiping him. When they won't have God, they'll certainly take him. But he's smart. He's clever. He's wise. You and I are no match for him at all. And you and I will be overcome if we try to go forth in our own strength against him. And he's not only beautiful, but he's full of wisdom. That's the way he's presented. He has ten horns. And I think that suggests the final division of the Roman Empire, which is dominated by Satan and which is his final effort to rule the world. And this fits into that picture. And the crowns on the horns, not on the heads, since it is delegated power, are from Satan. And the crowns represent kingly authority and rulership. And the third part of the stars of heaven follow him. That speaks of his rebellion. Daniel makes reference to this. And the dragon hates the man-child that the woman has. And we're told in Genesis 3.15, the beginning of it, I'll put enmity between thee, that is Satan, the dragon, and the woman, and between thy seed, Satan, and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, thou shalt bruise his heel. Now, we get a view of the child of the woman here, and in verses 5 and 6, why the child of the woman is introduced to us. And I'm reading from my translation. And she was delivered of a son, a man-child, who is to shepherd or to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. We sing that now in Psalm 2, 9. And her child was caught up unto God and his throne, and the woman fled into the wilderness. This world is a wilderness. Israel was scattered throughout the world. Where she hath a place prepared of God, and there they may nourish her a thousand two hundred and sixty days. And during the intense part of the great tribulation period, why Israel will be protected of God, 
that is, this remnant of Israel. And I would like to say this. There are those that say so dogmatically today that Israel will go to the rock-hewn city of Petrid, and there's where Israel will be preserved because no enemy can get in. But the enemy now comes from the top and drops down bombs. And that's the last place I would want to be when bombs start falling is in that rock-hewn city of Petra. Very candidly to make that dogmatic statement today along with clear-cut prophecies is certainly deceiving people. If you want to say that, and I don't mind saying it, I don't know where the place will be, and I personally feel like it could be this place, but let's say we don't know, and it won't hurt a lot of us preachers today to say we don't know when we don't know. I read a book on Antichrist the other day, and this fella, it took him about 125 pages to say what I can say in one sentence. But he wrote 125 pages. I don't know who is Antichrist. And he didn't either, my friend. He didn't either. Today, to be so dogmatic about that which is not revealed is, to my judgment, tragic. Now, I don't think that we ought to say dogmatically. If you want to say it, I don't object to it, provided you say, that's my judgment, or I think that it'll be. But you don't have scripture for that, you know except speculative scripture. Now will you notice, we're told here that the child, I think, is Christ. I think by now, that's quite evident. And he's easily identified here. And I hope that no one will fall into the error of equating the child with the church. And many have done that, by the way. Now, he's the shepherd to rule all the nations with the rod of iron as a clear-cut reference to Christ. We quoted Psalm 2.9, he shall break them with a rod of iron. Again, that was quoted by the early church, and it was quoted as referring to the day that began with the persecution of the church. But he's going to finally come to power. Now, her child was caught up unto God in his throne. Now, that speaks of the ascension of Christ. He ascended into heaven. Witnesses saw him caught up into heaven. And today we are looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now remember that this book is the unveiling of the ascended Christ. And the book of the Revelation rests upon the fact of the ascension Christ is the one who has opened the seals of the book that has led to all that has followed since then. And we're told that she brought forth a man-child. And I think that settles the identity of the woman. Israel is clearly the one from whom Christ came. Who are Israelites? Whom is concerning the flesh? Christ came. And we're going to pick that up next time. By the way, I see our time is up. So until next time, may God richly bless you, my beloved. Well, here at the beginning of the second half of Revelation, it might appear that Satan, the most dangerous being in all of God's creation, is the central character. But he's not. As Dr. McGee said, Revelation is about the unveiling of the ascended Christ. It's about Jesus, glorified and lifted up. This is the message of the whole Bible. And that's why we at Through the Bible are so glad to tell you about the largest access to online audio Bibles available to anyone in the world. Through a special relationship with the ministry Faith Comes by Hearing, we now offer access to the audio Bible in over 800 languages on our website, ttb.org. Just click on the button Bible in Your Language. You'll also see a link to the Bible.is app. That's B-I-B-L-E dot I-S which is available for Apple and Android mobile devices and offers the languages and text for anyone in the world all for free. This resource is one of our newest developments in keeping Dr. McGee's commitment to take the precious name of Jesus to the whole world. It also invites you to share the Bible with someone in your life who doesn't speak English. Language isn't a barrier in sharing the good news of Jesus Christ with the world. 
If we can help you find a Bible or any other resource, then please get in touch. Email us at biblebus at ttb.org. Call us at 1-800-652-4253. That's 1-800-65-BIBLE. Or write to Box 7100, Pasadena, California, 91109. In Canada, Box 25325. London, Ontario, N6C, 6B1. And as always, if you could let us know the call letters of the radio station that you listen to Through the Bible on, that would help us make good stewardship decisions in the future. Thanks so much. Here's a question for you. How could there be a war in heaven? We'll find out tomorrow here on Through the Bible. I'm Steve Schwetz, and I'll see you then. We're so grateful for the faithful and generous support of Through the Bible's partners who are being used by God to take the whole word to the whole world.